Okay, tonight we have a youth group doing our evening service. So I encourage you to come back, listen to them, sing, and bring a message from God's Word. Let's turn to number 349 in your hymnal, 349. We're going to sing the first four verses. On the fourth verse, we're going to change the key, just so you know, to be a little bit different note. So go watch me, and we'll probably mess it up together, but that's okay. First four verses. Let's stand together. We're going to sing one, two, three, and four. morning. So glad that you're here. We're excited about the day God has given to us. Uh, we're looking forward to Easter Sunday. Uh, there is a special announcement in your bulletin regarding uh, that very special day. We are going to have one extended, wonderful worship service that begins at 11 o'clock and will run through 1230. We want to have a day where you can come with your family and with your friends uh, extended as it is, and uh, worship God in a very special way. Our choir will be conducting a cantata during that time, and we'll certainly be uh, looking into the Word of God as well and all of the other things that we normally do. It's going to be a wonderful day. You won't want to miss it. Our one extended worship service begins at 11 o'clock and will run through 1230. Make sure you spread the word. Brother Les has mentioned that you want to be back tonight as our youth host the evening service, that's always a special treat for us, and uh, certainly be in prayer for our people. Many of them are hurting, some in the hospital, Brother Mel McFarlane um, and Ray Lewis, and, and then others of our people that are ill. Uh, we certainly need to be praying for one another. Please keep these precious folk in your prayers. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 11. We're reading the first nine verses, Genesis chapter 11 beginning with verse 1 and reading through the ninth, As you find it in the first book of the Bible, I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Come, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be withheld from them, which they have imagined to do. Come, let us go down. And there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there upon the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. 
and from there did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Thank you. you may be seated for a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we've uh, once again entered into these gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. We've come to worship you, God. We pray that every aspect of our service would do that very thing, including our giving. It's a privilege to be in this place. It's a privilege to be able to sing together. It's a privilege to be able to pray for one another. Certainly a privilege to be able to study your precious word together. Be our guide as we once again undertake that wonderful activity. God, I pray that you'll continue to shower your blessings upon us, but only so that we can be a blessing to others. And Lord, as we've acknowledged, so many of our people are hurting, and we want to be faithful in praying for each one. I pray that you would have your healing hand upon those who are ill, and even and especially those who are in the hospital. I pray, God, that you would be ministering and meeting the needs of each and every one of your people in this place. We thank you so much for our visitors we thank you so much for our friends. We thank you so much for our guests. I pray that everyone will be impacted for good and for God with the truth of God's holy and precious word. Lord, I pray that you would guide us then as we go about worshiping you today. It's with gladness in our hearts that we commit ourselves to you and pray, Lord, that our hearts indeed would be cultivated and ready to receive your truth. To God be the honor and glory this hour, we pray. In the matchless name of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.
very beautiful. Let's turn to number 415. 415 at Calvary. We're going to sing the first, second, and last. Uh, starting on the second, junior church will be dismissed. So we'll do one, two, and four. And let's stand together as you find it. 415, one, two, and four. care what they say about the time change. You guys sing like you're wide awake. <laughs> Maybe see.
She Thank you, ladies. We appreciate that. God has not only uh, gifted our adults, but he's gifted our young people as well, and we love and appreciate their willingness to, to, to serve God in that wonderful way. So many, well, I love uh, the songs, so many of our hymns and songs uh, whisk us away to Calvary, and we're reminded of his great, Christ's great substitutionary sacrifice on Calvary's cross and the salvation that we have in Christ and Christ alone. Uh, we would plead with those of you who have not yet trusted Christ, we would plead with you today again that today this time would be the time of your salvation. Let's pray together. God, thank you uh, for your love that is displayed for us in a pinnacled way on Calvary's cross. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lays down his life for others and Uniquely with Christ, it was the perfect, sinless God-man laying down his life for sinners, of which we all are, and doing so at a time when we were at enmity with you and him, our sin very effectively separating us from you, God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is indeed the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you that he is indeed the one and only Savior. Thank you that salvation comes to us rich and free by our simply recognizing our desperate need of Christ because of our sin and turning from such sin and embracing, receiving, believing on the one and only Savior. Again, our heart cry is that you would continue to save God. We know that you're long-suffering, and the reason for your long-suffering is because you desire for all men, every man, woman, and young person, to be saved, to be delivered, rescued from the penalty and condemnation of their sin. Keep saving. And, oh God, I pray that the Spirit of God would continue to apply effectually the gospel on the hearts of those who do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it not only presents to us Christ, paves the way for our salvation, but that it is clearly the perfect guidebook for life. Help us to continue to apply its very practical truth to our lives. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our study in Genesis continues. We are hovering over the biblical and historical 
narrative of the Tower of Babel event recorded in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. We pick up this morning with verse 5. Take a look as I read. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. A couple of things here. First of all, the phrase, the Lord came down to see. This is technically an anthropomorphism. We've talked about anthropomorphisms many times in the past. You know that it's one of Pastor Tom's favorite words even to say. When you have a vocabulary like me and when you have all of uh, my um, speech impediments, when you get to nail down a big word like that, it is a V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. When the writers of scripture attribute to God who is spirit, John 5, 24, human and physical characteristics, doing so in order for us to fully understand and appreciate God, that is called an anthropomorphism. In this case, we have an anthropomorphism in this way, God coming down to see. I, I can bring you along with me in regard to that. I mean, that's exactly the terminology that we would use with each other. If I came over to your house and was visiting with you and you were working on a project in your basement, you would say to me, Pastor Tom, I want you to come downstairs with me and see the project that I'm working on. So the terminology is on the human plane, obviously, and we're maybe taken back a little bit that it would be applied to God. Part of the reason for that is because of what we know to be true of God. God is both omnipresent and he is also omniscient. He is omnipresent, which means that he is everywhere present, which means that he doesn't have to come down. And he is omniscient, which means that he knows all, which in turn means that he doesn't have to come down to see. He is everywhere present, and he sees and knows all. In fact, that is a running theme throughout Scripture, and even us old-timers need to be reminded of that because when we walk away practically from this practical principle that God sees everything, and for us he holds us accountable for what he sees, man, we will tend to live our lives the way that God has commissioned to live them. These are vital and good reminders. But again, God is both omnipresent and omniscient. He doesn't need to come down. He doesn't need to come down to see. So what does this mean that, quote, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower? Well, you guys are good. You probably don't need for me to do this with you. And so for you, it would certainly be a rehearsal. But, but we worship and serve the sovereign God And we know that God, we've also already referenced this, we know that God is long-suffering, we know that he's merciful, we know that he normally and in measure allows man to do his own thing. Now, please know, I say to you in the same breath, a man is, is, is accountable, he's responsible, and he will someday have to answer for and suffer through the consequences of his evil deeds. But the fact of the matter is, practically speaking, the sovereign God is allowing man in measure to do his own thing. We've noted even with a view to the curse. If I can take you in your mind's eye very quickly back to the very beginning in the fall of man, Adam and Eve, their disobedience to God and the curse of sin. Even going so far as to trigger your thinking again about the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, that everything's winding down, wearing out. God, in, in measure, is letting sin run its course. And in that sense, man, again, in measure, is free. And that leads us to the dynamic that we hear. Sorry, I took a quick trick, trip. Uh, apart from you. That, that funnels down to the dynamic that we have here that God, again, has allowed man a measure of freedom and 
That's the reason why, and you will be in tune with this, and we often cite it together, again, the view of God's people that ungodliness on the part of man seems to thrive without any divine hindrance. How many times have we been studying through the scriptures and specifically the Psalms Wednesday nighters? Got to remember to breathe. Rats, I just sometimes forget to breathe and I run out of air. And I have my breathe rock here, so I, I don't need any more rocks. I just need to, I just need to read the rock. How many times have we been studying, especially through the Psalms, and we've come across the psalmist, often David, but also others as well, including Asaph Wednesday Nighters, where, where they're crying out in regard to the temporary prosperity of the wicked. They would say, how long, God, do we got to put up with this junk? God's long-suffering, he is letting man in measure do his thing. He is allowing sin, again, in measure to run its course. And so God's people often arrive at the place where they say with frustration, God, how long do we have to put up with this stuff? When we think it all the way through, by the way, we can be very glad that God's long-suffering, not only with the evildoers, but oftentimes even with us as people. And we're so thankful for his mercy, again, not only for us, but for others. But it's with a view, again, to this dynamic that God's letting things run its course. He's standing off, as it were. I'm being careful with the terminology. He's the sovereign God. He's in control of everything. But again, he's letting man do in measure his thing. But even that needs to be policed by the sovereign God, and it is. And so we only go so long before we arrive at a place, especially with our study of the scriptures, we only go so long before we arrive at the place where we see the God of necessity with a view to his eternal plan has got to intervene. And such is the case with the Tower of Babel, which is yet another powerful testimony to the gravity of man's sin here. God's got to come down. God's about to do something. He's about to do something directly. And again, that isn't always the norm. By the way, we have this very same terminology. You students of the word probably have already thought this thought. We have this very same terminology just a little bit further down the road in uh, Genesis chapter 18 with the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the grave sin of homosexuality. God comes down. We catch God coming down, about to do something again directly every once in a while. And here's one of those times, the Tower of Babel. Again, I know, and I'm speaking of me, not you, I know that as I work my way through via study of the Tower of Babel incident that I will not yet fully understand everything that is here. But God's about to do something. By the way, we've already identified and will continue to speak the words that the judgment that is forthcoming is relatively mild, but judgment is coming. Something else in verse 5, I think I've touched on this with you already, but I, I want to be clear. We are informed that the city and tower were built, past tense. I'm referencing verse 5. Verse 5 informs us that the city and tower is built. It's actually a little bit stronger in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, we have the perfect tense, which is past action with abiding results. The city and the tower were built. And you say, oh, Pastor Tom, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal about that is verse 8 clearly states that as God confounds the languages, here's this mild judgment. We have yet to talk about it in detail. You're going to have to stick with us. Wow. As God confounds the language of the people and they scatter, they also in turn, quote, left 
off building or, quote, ceased building the city. And so from verse 5 to verse 8, it appears again on the surface that we have a significant contra contradiction. However, and again, I think this may be a review, although I'm not sure, it, it, the contradiction supposed it is easily resolved. The original initial um, city and its tower were indeed built, verse 5, completed. But because post-flood man, and you know this well, and again, this is so interesting and certainly ironic, because post-flood man was multiplying while at the same time refusing to spread out and scatter, the city of necessity had to be increasingly expanding. We have the very same thing happening today, as you know, even with our cities, not all of them, some growing, growing, growing. By the way, and I shouldn't sidetrack you, but that certainly was true historically of Jerusalem and the walls that surrounded Jerusalem. And so if you know anything about the history of Jerusalem and the city, and you do, then you know that, that the walls continued to expand out. And the city, in regard to that, grew. So it's the expansion of the city which came to an end with the confusion of languages in verse 8. And so again, no problem. Now, take a look at verse 6 as I read. And they said, oh, verse 6, and the Lord said, behold, the people are one. Oh, I, I'm interrupting the reading. We always go that way. I think you're sensing that with me. We're in the process of coming to grips with the gravity of the sin here in regard to the Tower of Babel incident and we're learning things about man. We're getting to know man and the heart of man better, fuller. And, and I haven't said it like this. I guess I want to say it now. Perhaps we'll say it like this again down the road as well. But it always goes like this. Man, ultimately, if he's not united for God and the things of God, he ultimately will be united against God and against the things of God. And so again, here's the dynamic. And the Lord said, behold, the people are one. I'm interrupting your reading again. Wow, I'm going to have to give some of your money back. The day is coming when legitimately everything will be one, but that day is when the Lord Jesus Christ literally and physically sets on the literal and physical throne of a literal um, and, and physical Jerusalem in the literal and physical land of Israel, the millennial reign of Christ. Isn't it interesting that we're always headed towards a one world thing, either for good or for bad? Now, read verse 6 and do not stop the reading. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be withheld from them which they have imagined to do. I know I've already spit out some things for you in regard to this, but I see one primary thing here, a principle, and that is that we are always on the move spiritually. And again, please see and appreciate the irony here. Here's post-flood man. He is not on the move physically. He is saying we are taking our stand here, and it, of course, is in defiance of God. Post-flood man is not on the move physically. You and I may not be on the move physically, but man is always on the move spiritually. Did you hear that? Every single man, woman, and young person is always, on the move, spiritually. We're always heading somewhere spiritually. We are either heading toward wickedness, as post-flood man is here, or we are headed towards righteousness. It's either godliness or ungodliness. And the principle, please note with me, is applicable not only to men and women and young people who don't know God, who are in rebellion to God, but also to God's people. 
You are on the move. See how God, and we've been here before, but you see how God is prompting even God's people to pause and reflect on which way the arrow's pointing? Because the arrow's always pointing somewhere. We are always on the move. And it's easy for us to plug that principle in in regard to post-flood man here, again, as we come to grips with this rebellion against the righteous and holy God. But what about us? What about Calvary? Which way is the arrow pointing for Calvary? And what about me? And what about you? Which way is the arrow pointing? You're on the move spiritually. It's either toward godliness or ungodliness. Which way is the arrow pointing. We're either going up or down. We're either increasing or decreasing. We're either living or dying spiritually. I'm afraid, and I'm speaking broadly, I'm afraid that we've become apathetic. I, I'm afraid that we have um, been... Uh, been dozing and have allowed our enemy who so often initially attacks our minds to convince us that we can live our lives in stasis, that we can live in neutral, that we can live in a stagnancy. We wouldn't say it out loud, but we think that we have arrived and that's why were we to be honest before God, and that's what it boils down to, we'd have to recognize that many of God's people, maybe me, that in some measure I've, I've put on the cruise control. How rebuking Paul's words in Philippians 3, verses 10 through 14 that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I may, a, I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I have already attained or either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Folks, is that descriptive of our lives? Not. If I have set the cruise control, oh, the passion, the pathos of God's people in the scriptures. And oh, how that ought to be matched by the pathos and passion of God's people in this 21st century. Now, verse 7a. reading's done. It's verse 7a, it's not verse 7b, c, d, e, or f. Come. Follow this. This is the third time that we've seen the word in our text. Davy has, by the way, go to the new scope of reference has blocked that off and inserted the word come. The NIV and the NASB, come. The Hebrew, yahab, it's a primitive root. It's translated in a number of different ways, but primarily as come. I'd like to use the word, it's God's. 
It's interesting to compare and contrast the usages of the word come in our text. First time we see the word come is in verse 3. I'm reading. And they said one to another, come, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. The first come, this is interesting. See if you catch this. You note takers, you want to write this down. The first come is spoken by man to man against God. By man to man against God. Again, this is prideful man in rebellion against God. Such is also the case with the second come. We have that in verse 4 again. I read, and they said, come, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Again, the word come spoken by man to man against God. And then the third come is what we have in verse 7. This in contrast to the first two. Come, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. The first two comes are spoken by man to man against God. But the third come is spoken by God to God It's communion amongst the triune Godhead. The third come is spoken by God to God against man. The first two comes, I can tell you're thrilled out of your seats with this. The first two comes are spoken by man to man against God. The third come is spoken by God to God against man. You probably don't need for me to do this with you, but I do it just the same. This is certainly not the end of the story. In fact, if it was the end of the story, you and I would absolutely be in despair without hope in this world with a view to Ephesians 2.12. Wouldn't be right for us to end without noting that the Bible also knows a third use of the word come. Not just where man is saying it to man against God, nor where God is saying it to God against man, but glory hallelujah where God is saying it to man for man. Come. It's an invitation. We've hovered over the word before, and the reason why we have is because it's the most wonderful. This usage of the word, it gets no better than this, that the offended God, remember we all are sinners, and our sin very effectively separates us from God, but the offended God sent his only begotten son, who was perfect, so that he, through his perfect life and his perfect death, could bear the penalty of your and my sin, so that we wouldn't have to. It's our problem, and God solved it. And the only thing that he asks us to do, the only thing we can do in regard to that, is embrace, listen, his gracious invitation. Too precious to work for. All you can do is humbly come. And receive. An invitation from God to man. For man. For him to come and first of all be saved. That's where it starts. It's the all important first thing. But not that alone. It's part of the reason why you are here today, because you're celebrating the fact not only that you have been wonderfully and miraculously saved through simple childlike faith in the one and only Savior, but he's secured you, and he sustains you, and he strengthens you, 
and he satisfies you. Are there any more precious words in the word of God than this? Christ's words in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28, come. Come. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me. Listen, let me interject something here as I have you that far in your thinking. At every single turn, we see the stark contrast between man's religions and true biblical Christianity. I've shared this with you before. I do it again this morning with added passion. Man's religion invariably says go, and then maybe you can come. Go and work. Go and do this and that and the other thing, and then maybe, just maybe, you can come. And true biblical Christianity says, come. And then for certain, with power, you can go. There are many religions. One. True biblical Christianity. There are many ways in which prideful man attempts to reach out to God. But only with true biblical Christianity does God do what only he can do. And that is he reaches way, 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 way down to rescue sinful men. I wonder Calvary would be preaching and teaching Christ. No wonder she would hold to with conviction that there is only one gospel centered in on the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation, man's, Only through simple childlike faith and trust in the one and only Savior. Have you come to Jesus? This is interesting. We, we end our services almost invariably with some kind of invitation. Um, <clears throat> we, I, I don't know that we ever pressure And I'm not necessarily always calling you to actually stand up and leave your pew and come. Although I always offer my services to you and I trust you and I'm offering my heart. And I've said time and time again and will continue to say to you that I'd be absolutely thrilled. There is no greater thrill in this life for me than to sit down with you and share with you more about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I've always said, do you come? I've been so... Uh, I was going to say bold, that isn't the word. I've been so crazy as to say to you that, man, if the Spirit of God's tugging on your heart, you can come even before the service ends. <laughs> no one's taking that up, uh, picking me up on that, and it would re really be interesting, but I, I would welcome that. But I want you to know something. Here's the, I, I think it reflects on the blessedness of the gospel. You're, the invitation is not to come to Pastor Tom. I'm in the same boat you are. We all are sinners. We all are in desperate need of the one and only Savior. The invitation is to come to Jesus. Let me tell you this. I may get in a little bit of trouble with it. The, the invitation is not necessarily for you to come to the altar, whatever that is. Now again, we've invited you to come and we invariably will do that again. But I want you to know again this morning that walking the aisle, coming to the altar, whatever the altar is, that does not save you. What saves you is coming to Jesus. 
And we're back to the singularity and the simplicity of the gospel. And let me tell you this. You can come to Jesus right where you sit. Here's my twofold plea. Come to Jesus right where you sit and come right now. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment? L listen, I, I don't know your heart, only God knows it. I, I don't even really know your pattern, certainly from a spiritual standpoint. You know, we, we once again, we, we've ended up with the gospel, we invariably do. And, and maybe the gospel is new to you. Or perhaps, maybe you've heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. There is a Savior. We are sinners. There is a Savior. That Christ and Christ alone through his death, burial, and resurrection offers to you the forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. You perhaps have heard the gospel many, many times, over and over and over again, and yet you still have not come. Perhaps you're even a regular church attender, but alas, you have not come. Would you come this morning? I'm not talking about you leaving your seat. Would you come to Jesus this morning right where you are? And would you come right now? Let him save you this morning. In the quietness of this moment, would you pray and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior? Remember, we are all spiritually on the move and you're either walking away from or toward the one and only Savior. And listen, now is the time of your salvation. Would you come to Jesus this morning right where you sit? Would you come right now? Would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I've heard about you again today. I've been reminded of the good news the bad news is I'm a sinner. The good news is there is a Savior, only one. Only one who lived perfectly, who died for me, was subsequently buried and then rose from the grave, demonstrating that his sacrifice actually works. And this morning, via this prayer, I'm coming to Jesus. This morning, I'm praying to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior from sin. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm not going to ask for any kind of physical response, but rather a personal plea. Would you, if you prayed that prayer, I would love to know, not to hound you, I would love to know so that I can pray for you. It's the biggest and most important decision in all of life. If you prayed that prayer, would you just take a second as we're dismissed to fill out the green card in the pew in front of you, letting us know that you prayed that prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessed gospel. And Lord, salvation goes beyond, goes beyond our simply being forgiven. And, and, and so the message this morning it's not just for those who have not yet put their faith and trust in Christ, but it's for those of us who have. And the principle, among many other things which we've seen this morning via our study, the, the principle that we're always spiritually on the move, ought to move your people as much as it does those who do not yet belong to you. And oh God, that each and every one of our arrows would be pointing to, toward godliness and, and passion and devotion and commitment to this one who loved us and gave himself for us. And God, we pray for those who perhaps have just prayed to receive Christ and as they now join us in the great adventure of loving and serving him, 
I pray that their decision would be driven deep in their hearts, and I pray that they would let somebody know. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. We are so glad you're here this morning to hear the truth about Jesus Christ. Let's turn to number 408 in closing. 408. I surrender all. all. If you find it, let's stand together. 408. Brother Jeff, would you close us in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you the the new life that salvation brings. I pray with that life that we would choose to change our motives to those that would be pleasing to you instead of self-seeking. Guide us in this um, daily and moment-by-moment challenge that you've given to us that we live our lives for you. In Christ's name, amen.